Thank you to Brianna, an operations manager for CBS in Wisconsin. Thank you to the Geno's crew in Long Beach for keeping us well fed. Thank you to Jeremy of North Babylon, who works at the LIRR Hillside Maintenance Complex and is also a paramedic with Bayshore Brightwaters Ambulance. And thank you to Gregory, a biomedical engineer at Long Island Community Hospital in Patchogue. Thank you to Nicole, a nurse at Southside Hospital in Bayshore. Are you an essential worker or know someone who is? And we want to hear from you. All we need is the picture, the person's name, the village or town, and what that person does for a living. Every night, right here at 7, we will be thanking the people who have been on the front lines during this pandemic. Just go to the News 12 Facebook or Twitter page. Good evening, I'm Stone Grissom and welcome to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Tonight we have a doctor from Long Island Jewish Medical Center to help you sort through what's going on with COVID-19 in our communities and across the region. And of course, every night we want to hear from you. Call us at the number at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. Well, Governor Cuomo said we are at another pivot point in considering reopening each region. Now, Long Island, we remain on pause as the state's seventh region has already began its first phase of reopening today. The governor says the consequences of reopening economic activity depends on what we actually do. Our medical doctors have been saying the same thing. He also says religious ceremonies of up to 10 people that can resume in the state starting tomorrow if attendees wear masks and maintain social distance. Now today, Cuomo revealed that new testing at community churches suggested New York's new virus cases are actually coming from the low income and minority communities, especially in the city. Statewide, we're now at more than 354,000 positive cases of COVID-19. Long Island, we account for nearly 78,000 of those cases. Now the death toll in the state, uh, the numbers are hard to even, I mean, each one of these numbers, that's a person. Almost 23,000 New York lives lost. Nassau Executive Laura Kern says the number of people dying every day is shrinking, though. She says as long as fatalities continue to go down, Nassau can meet that last metric to reopen and enter phase one. Now, the coronavirus has claimed the lives of more than 3,800 Nassau and Suffolk residents combined. All right, let's begin our conversation again tonight. Joining us once again, Dr. Fred Davis, Associate Chair of Emergency Medicine at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and friend of the show at this point. We thank you very much for your time, what you do every day, um, and taking your time to uh, spend it with us. Uh, and again, sure. uh, how are you continuing to hold up throughout this? You know, I, I think one of the things is we've had a lot of support. I think a lot of people in the community, as well as our fellow staffs, has really been there for everyone to get us through these tough times. And I think we're we're really there to make sure everyone else is okay now and really help take care of the rest of the public and society. Yeah, and I think uh, a point you made the last time you were on the show, and I think it's something that uh, would would be good to say again, is that as we begin potentially reopening, um, the hospitals aren't necessarily a place where you need to avoid 100% at this point, right? Right. I think initially there was a concern that the hospitals were a place where uh, many people were going that had were infected with COVID-19. However, at, we've worked hard. A lot of hospitals throughout the system have really worked hard to make sure that it's a safe place to still be able to treat many different uh, patients for all different concerns, whether it be for chest pains or strokes. We made sure there was a safe place for them to be treated appropriately with uh, no chance of really getting uh, cross-contamination at this point. Okay, um, and I've, I have to ask this question real quick because uh, I've, I've gotten this several times on social media and uh, in other ways. Um, this is a person who is caring for uh, the person's spouse the spouse tested positive, was actually hospitalized, and is now back home, and this person's negative. Um, are, th are there any special precautions that this person needs to do before going back to work? So I, I think one of the things you always want to worry about is when you know a spouse or loved one or someone you share a common space with does test positive, you always want to make sure you're doing the same exact things we tell everybody. Make sure your proper hand hygiene, uh, make sure that anything that comes in contact, specifically anything that has a droplet or someone coughing in an area like sharing utensils, 
uh, those things are cleaned properly and sharing and make sure that those are washed properly. As far as going back to work, uh, one of the things you always wanna make sure, especially this day and age, is that they're wearing a mask appropriately and that there's uh, less of a risk of them uh, contracting anything or infecting other coworkers well, from the environment they might be in. Yeah, that's good, good advice. All right, let's go to uh, Dan from Seacliff. Dan, you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, what, what's your question tonight? Hi, Dr. Davids. Uh, yes, my question is, um, I haven't seen anything about gastrointestinal um, effects of uh, associated with uh, COVID-19. Um, I know that there were two studies, one out of Stanford University and one out of Wuhan, that said a, between a third and 50% of COVID-19 patients do have gastrointestinal uh, problems associated with the disease. My question is really, if you suspect that, how do you treat it? And when would you have to seek say emergency room uh, um, help. Okay. Sure. I think there's been a lot of different uh, symptoms that we've seen with COVID-19. Uh, gastrointestinal effects definitely have been one of the higher ones. Uh, we have seen people coming in with abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all of have been associated with uh, the viral infection. Uh, similar to other viral infections, a lot of the things have been uh, preventative in nature in which we can do, so plenty of fluids, uh, making sure you that you can keep something down, some sort of hydration, uh, whether that be some sort of mixture of Gatorade, something to give you both sugar, electrolytes, uh, so that you don't become too dehydrated. As far as when to seek emergency care would be when that all fails, when you can't keep food down, uh, when you are starting to the point where you're vomiting everything up and losing a lot of fluids through that vomiting or through diarrhea, that's when it might be important to seek emergency care for IV hydration or to give medication to help really calm down those symptoms. Okay, let's go to Belmore and mm -hmm. Paul, you there? Yes, I am, how are you? I'm doing great, what's your question tonight? Uh, Dr. Fred, I've got a question. Well, obviously all of mankind wants to be healthy and safe from the current viral pandemic and all future virus threats. Now, if it's yes. true that scientific researchers at the Center for Radiological Research at Columbia University, Irving Medical Center, believe that they found a new low-cost solution for eradicating airborne viruses with the likelihood that an LED ultraviolet C frequency of about 222 nanometers can kill coronavirus and is safe for human skin and eye tissue. And it was published in scientific reports. There's an article that indicates that and suggests uh, use of an overhead UVC light to check viral outbreaks. Now, I question, do you think that these LED lamps could be used first for humans concealed in moving air ducts in hospitals, doctor's offices, schools, offices, okay, uh, airports? Let's, let's, get the, let's get the doctor to respond to that, uh, doctor. Sure. Yeah, they, they, it's a great point. I think uh, we have started to see a lot of uh, more use of UV lights, uh, particularly to help break down a lot of viral particles. It has been used before for specific bacteria to clean rooms, uh, specifically with certain bacteria like uh, C. diff, which causes diarrhea, uh, and has been used in other viruses and has been shown to actually be effective. I think the, and, and yes, w it would be a great thing to have, especially in areas that have uh, large amounts of people, such as you know airplanes, uh, mass transit, schools, and, and, and hospitals. So. I think there has been a lot of work as research uh, expands to really include this and to help really uh, disinfect circulating air, and it's just to the extent of which it has uh, can be effective in those in those modalities. Okay, um, Neil from East Meadow. Neil. Yes. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, as a dentist, I'm obviously concerned with sanitizing everything in my office, not just the smooth countertop surfaces. I was wondering what your opinion is on using sanitizing fogging mist, such as hypochlorous acid. It's already used in industries like restaurants, hospitals, supposedly safe for people and food. The question I have is, does it kill viruses effectively? That's a, that's a great question. I think it, you know, it's, it's one of those uh, substances that has been found in white blood cells produce it to really uh, naturally kill off bacteria and viruses. So it has been shown to be effective in those instances. 
Uh, particularly, uh, there has been some initial research to show that it might be effective in this specific virus to break it down and might be as effective as things like bleach products. So I, it sounds like it is a possible alternative to possibly use to wipe down surfaces. And especially since you do come in contact with where the major source is with people's mouths, that is a big concern to make sure you're using uh, the right concentration and the right amount to break down what could be contaminated areas. Okay. Uh, Lorraine from Lido Beach. Lorraine? Yes. Um, hi. Good evening. Um, my question is, what are the lasting COVID effects for the brain on the elderly? My mother, six weeks ago, she could talk, she could answer a phone, she could feed herself. She was positive. She's been negative the last week. She can't do any of this now. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I know there's a lot of developing things we're starting to see uh, long-term effects, and I think we won't necessarily know what the extent of those long-term effects until we have more time uh, with what we are currently seeing with the virus. There have been a number of cases of patients that have been infected, uh, specifically those who are elderly, do, who do have uh, some long-lasting neurological effects, uh, whether that be something as you know more forgetfulness, uh, difficulty with balance, or difficulty doing a lot of the things they normally could do otherwise. Uh, we're hoping that's temporary. We know the nerves tend to uh, really have a prolonged tract of time in which they regenerate. So just saying things like the, the loss of taste and smell takes a while for it to regenerate. We're hoping that the same will happen with a lot of the nerve cells that were maybe were damaged or have some exposure because of increased inflammation. But unfortunately, it's one of those things where all we can say is uh, time will really tell. Okay, and uh, real quick, let me paraphrase this next question. This is from uh, um, Lucina from Selden. Uh, she does facials in a spa. She's asking, uh, is there any safe way to treat her, her clients in this environment? Uh, I, again, just, just like you know, doing anything uh, close to the mouth, you are at risk. Uh, so making sure uh, the provider can really wear a mask and also uh, reduce the risk of exposure to any kind of respiratory particles, washing hands, possibly also wearing gloves and changing those gloves uh, between any kind of uh, interaction with any people will help uh, really reduce the risks. Okay, uh, we're gonna take a real quick break. When we come back, we're gonna have more expert advice on how to keep you and your family safe from the coronavirus. And remember, we do wanna hear from you. So call us with your questions at the number right there. The number doesn't change, 516-393-1800. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Let's bring back in Dr. Fred Davis, Associate Chair of Emergency Medicine at Long Island Jewish Medical Center. Um, appreciate your time again tonight. Uh, let's go back to the phone lines. Susan uh, from Ronkonkoma. Susan? Okay, I have a question about my daughter's 24 years old. I'm her surrogate I'm in charge of everything. I went through the surrogate court to become her guardian. She doesn't speak. She's a quadriplegic. I'd like to know why the Department of Health only takes reports and doesn't go into the nursing homes to find out why these people that are in there that are young are being abused. Uh, I don't know if the doctor can answer that, but uh, that, that's yeah. Like you know, that, that's a, a question. Definitely, I would definitely bring back to the Department of Health. I'm sure if there's substantial claims, uh, they do investigate a lot of claims that are brought to their attention. Uh, so I'm sure if it's something that is specifically a concerning, I would definitely bring it to their attention and uh, make sure they follow through on some of these. Um, concerns. Okay, um, and I apologize for possibly mispronouncing this. Is this Aki? Yes. Oh, I got yes. it right. Okay, Sayasa, Thanks. what's your question tonight? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, I would like to ask the doctor about um, December holidays. We went on a vacation to Texas. During the flight on that airplane, a lot of people were coughing and sneezing around me and I, I was really worried about it. Anyway, I got there, I got sick after two days and the pressure was in my chest, breathing was hard. I had to come back home like that. I, unfortunately, I got on the airplane again. So, so is your question, should you get the antibody test? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, possibly had it, should she uh, get the antibody test? Yeah. You know, it's definitely one of those things. Uh, December was fairly early on to see. I don't think we've had any specific known cases in the United States in, in December. 
Um, but with those symptoms, obviously at that time of year could also be consistent with the flu that was definitely prevalent. Uh, there's no harm in getting the antibody test. I think it will put your mind at ease to let you know if you were exposed or not uh, from that flight uh, or from something since then. And I think it will help you really get a better idea of what those symptoms might have been related to at that point. Okay. Um, how about, uh, is it Mandeep from Huntington Station? Yes. Uh, what's your question tonight? My question is, uh, how soon a dentist should start working, the older, old, elderly dentist? So I, I know that the ADA has uh, set out guidelines, particularly right now. I know their recommendations has been uh, for just emergency uh, procedures. I know that there has been some concern on when uh, someone particularly of an older age or has risk factors can uh, go back to work. Uh, I know that because you're a dentist, there is a very higher risk because you're um, up in an area where there is a high likelihood of aerosolized exposure should someone come positive. Um, some facilities, I know in the hospital field, specifically things like uh, ENTs or doctors that deal with the ear, nose, and throats, they're requiring patients to get tested prior to seeing them as patients. Uh, and so they would require a testing of a negative uh, result before they would then do any kind of further evaluation uh, on them. So that might be something to possibly pursue. Uh, but I know the uh, American Dentistry Association definitely uh, has been putting out guidelines for, for those recommendations. Okay, let's, uh, Deborah, are you there? Hi. Hi, what's your question tonight? Oh, yeah, it was similar to the other gentleman's question. I was calling to see if, if it's safe to go to, like, well, mine's a dentist or the orthodontist. I get those um, Invisalign trays done, and mm -hmm. um, I'm, I need another round. And it's not the kind that you bite into the tray. It's a wand they stick in your mouth and, and take the impression. I was wondering how safe that is. So I, I think um, for, for being the patient, you're probably at less risk. Many times the dentist themselves will be wearing a mask. Um, so I would definitely, if the dentist is practicing and, and feels comfortable seeing you, I would definitely re re defer in that case to the dentist uh, when you should particularly go back to follow up your care there. Okay, uh, let's see if we can squeeze uh, Sandy from Ronkonkoma. Are you there? Yes, I am. What, what's your question tonight? Okay, my question is, I had the virus for four weeks. I didn't have to be hospitalized. I also had the pneumonia. And now I'm better. But I noticed after this was all said and done, I don't have a hearing problem, but I have a noise in my ears that is all day and it just doesn't go away. And I'm wondering, can this be from the virus? Because I never had this before. So, so there's, there's, a, there's always a possibility a lot of the symptoms we are seeing are just developing. We see new symptoms that have been related to the virus. Uh, there's a lot of inflammation that goes on after this virus in the body, and it, we know it does affect other areas of the body, like nerve cells. So could it affect your hearing? Very possible. However, I would still recommend getting a, a more thorough evaluation by an ear, nose, and throat doctor that deals with um, your hearing and can take a better look uh, in the ear and decide whether or not this is particularly related to a post inflammatory condition from COVID-19 or whether there's something else that just happens to coincide uh, during your recovery. Okay, unfortunately that is all the time we have uh, um, right now. So Dr. Davis, thank you very much. I hope you stay safe, uh, stay on the front yeah. lines because we need you uh, every day and thank you so much for everything you're doing. All right, and thank you for watching tonight and we'll see you right back here tomorrow at seven. Stay safe, I'm Stone Grissom.